Well, good evening, Highland Park. I'm so glad that we get to gather together in this virtual way once again for our Wednesday evening Bible study. I want to remind you that you can check your email and the specific place on our website where we have our prayer sheets uh, hosted there for you, and you can download the prayer guide and be up to date on the various prayer concerns affecting our church and members of our church and those connected to us in various ways. And I want to encourage you once again to utilize that prayer sheet as a guide in your own prayer life as we care for one another, pray for one another, watch over one another's souls through prayer. It's such an important ministry that we can have toward one another, especially during this time where we're physically isolated from each other. I'm just so thankful that as a church I continue to hear about ways that you're caring for one another. I continue to hear from various ones of you who have prayed for me and I'm so thankful for that. I know we're all praying for one another and that's really a great comfort and encouragement to me. And in just a moment, uh, John Wilsey is going to be joining us. Many of you know John. He's a faithful member here at Highland Park along with his wife Mandy and his two daughters. And we're so thankful that the Wilsey family is with us here at Highland Park. And I'm thankful to know John as a friend, but also as a colleague at Southern Seminary. John is a very gifted teacher and communicator. The Lord called him to ministry and has utilized him in a number of different ministries. He served as a pastor and in other teaching ministry roles. And of course, right now he teaches at Southern Seminary. And so I'm excited that John has this opportunity to teach us for a little while from God's Word. And so over the course of the next few weeks, John is going to begin a series on the book of Jeremiah. And he will teach for the next few weeks, and then there will be a bit of a pause on his teaching. And I will come back and do some more teaching, and then John will pick up again. And he's going to continue taking us through the book of Jeremiah as long as it takes to just walk through this incredible book of prophecy in God's Word. And so I know you're going to enjoy uh, hearing John as he teaches from the book of Jeremiah. And so before John comes, I'm going to open us with a word of prayer. And I know he's also going to, to pray for us as we hear God's word. But I want to pray for our church. And I want to pray for our ongoing ministries and for you. And encourage you to take advantage of this moment to pray for one another. Let's go to the Lord together. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful that you have given us your word so that we can go to it and we can get your perspective on the world. We can understand who you are and what you're doing in world history and what you're doing in our lives and what your purpose is for our lives. And Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for what your word tells us about your son, Jesus, who is our redeemer and savior, our ruler, our friend. Lord, we thank you that he has redeemed us through his blood. And, and by his resurrection, we know that we can have eternal life and Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that gives us comfort and confidence in you even in hard times. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to stay encouraged and to continue to hope in you. Help us to love one another well during this crisis we've been going through of isolation and separation. Lord, help us to stay safe and healthy, but most importantly, help us grow in grace. Lord, I pray for those in our church family who are weak and sick and in need of special care and of your tender mercies. And I pray that you would grant those things to them and that you would care for them, that you would bring healing to those who are sick and that you would bring strength to those who are weak. Lord, I pray that you would comfort us all in our afflictions and Lord, just stir us up to love and good deeds even as we seek to love and care for one another. Lord, we are asking you by your mercy to hasten the day when we can gather together physically again and we can unite together again as a community of faith, as a church family. Lord, that you would hasten that day, just as we always long, Lord, for you to hasten the day of Christ's return. We join with John in the book of Revelation in saying, Come, Lord Jesus. And now, Lord, as we hear from John Wilsey, I pray that you'd open our minds and our hearts and prepare us just to be hearing from your word from the prophet Jeremiah. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John's going to come now and share with us an introduction to the book of Jeremiah. Hello there. I'm John Wilsey, and I'm looking forward to walking through the book of Jeremiah uh, with Highland Park over the next uh, several weeks. Um, 
So this is going to be a Wednesday night study that uh, we're going to, to do for the long term um, with some breaks in between. Um, but for the next six weeks, uh, we're going to start off. We're going to begin with a, an introduction to the book of Jeremiah, we're going to set some historical background, and then we're going to walk through the text. And so I'm looking forward to, to uh, walking through Jeremiah with you and looking forward to having you join me in this, uh, in this journey through this wonderful, wonderful book. As we get started, I, I do want to just open with a, a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless our time and to open up his word to our understanding. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for revealing yourself to us. Lord, you made us and you saved us. And as you save us, you reveal yourself, you reveal your will, you reveal your character, and you reveal to us our need for you. And of course, the ultimate revelation that we have of you is in Jesus. We thank you for Jesus for coming down and for becoming a man and for living a perfect life and for dying a sinner's death rising again on the third day, that we might have the victory in you. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would open up your word to our understanding, that you would illumine, illumine our minds, that you would help us to understand what the meaning and message of Jeremiah is as we walk through the text. Father, thank you for everyone who is uh, participating in this Bible study. I pray that you would uh, bless each person, each family, that you would uh, be near to us as we draw near to you. And Lord, as we uh, walk through Jeremiah, that we would see your faithfulness, that we would see Christ uh, in the life of Jeremiah, revealed in the Old Testament, revealed in the New. We worship and praise you, Lord God. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, let me just begin with some general information about the book of Jeremiah. What is this book? Uh, you know, it's a great big book. It's the largest book of the, the Bible, uh, excepting the Psalms. Uh, Isaiah has more chapters than Jeremiah, but Jeremiah has the most number of verses than any other book in the Bible, except for the Psalms. And um, the, the ironic thing about this book is that um, Jeremiah is one of the least read and least understood books in the Bible. Uh, I was looking at... Um, a survey that Crossway did a couple of years ago about, you know, the survey was done um, uh, asking evangelical Christians, you know, practicing Christians, uh, practicing conservative Christians, um, you know, based on the book of the Bible, six, six books of the Bible, how often do you read, you know, any given book? So basically the, the survey was about, you know, what are the most widely read uh, books of the Bible? And Jeremiah, it's interesting, is is actually one of the most widely read books in the Old Testament. But here's the thing. The least read New Testament book, which is the book of Philemon, according to the survey, Philemon is the least read New Testament book. The least read New Testament book is still more widely read than any Old Testament book except for Genesis, Psalms, Isaiah, and Job. Uh, so, when we say that Jeremiah is one of the most widely read Old Testament books, it's not really saying very much compared to what Christians are, are reading in the New Testament. Um, and even when the survey looks at you know, those, those widely read books, most people's understanding of the book of Jeremiah is limited really to Jeremiah 1 verse 5, before I formed you in the womb I knew you, which is a text we often hear around... Um, you know, January 20th, 21st, around uh, Roe v. Wade Sunday, uh, Sanctity of Life Sunday. <clears throat> and then we also, of course, hear uh, a lot of times referenced Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, uh, which is the promise of restoration uh, for the people after a 70-year exile in Babylon. So between those two passages, uh, aside from those two passages, those two small passages, most people don't really understand Jeremiah, even though it's one even though it's really the longest book of the Bible other than the Psalms. Another thing that's interesting is that in the book of Jeremiah, uh, the author of Jer Jeremiah, is the, obviously the author, Baruch was his secretary who recorded his prophecies. We know more about Jeremiah as a man than we know about any other of the major prophets. We know about more about him personally than we know about Isaiah 
we know more about him personally, far more about him personally than we do about Ezekiel or really any of the prophets for that matter because Jeremiah is a very autobiographical book. We really get an inside look at the man, his inner struggles, his inner doubts, his prayer life. We know about his innermost desires and how those desires, many of those desires were not met. We see his love for Jerusalem and we see his love for his people and yet we also see his anger at the people and their sin. More is known about him than any other prophet and he is, he is really credited with the survival of the Jewish people after Nebuchadnezzar's siege of Jerusalem in 586 BC. And yet, Jeremiah is also one of the most misunderstood Old Testament prophets. A lot of folks, when they uh, think about Jeremiah or they hear Jeremiah's name mentioned, they think gloom and doom, you know. Jeremiah is the weeping prophet. You know, he's the one that has all the, all the horrible messages in it, all the, all the really depressing stuffs in Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah is the author of Lamentations, you know. Well, wow, that's not really the most, power, uh, the most popular book of the Bible either. You know, not too many people read Lamentations. There's only one verse in Lamentations that most people even know about the faithfulness of God, right? But, but very few Christians, just generally speaking in America, read Jeremiah or Lamentations because the, the, the understanding is that it's depressing. And nothing could be further from the truth. Jeremiah is deeply convicting and also enormously encouraging because we see the mercy, the grace, and the love of God even in his judgment of his people. We see God does not give his people up entirely. He always preserves a remnant. Many have looked at Jeremiah and judged it to be a very difficult book to understand. Um, for one thing, people who think that they do have a point, Jeremiah is, is difficult to understand. For one thing, there's no clear chronological arrangement. Jer the book of Jeremiah is, is, not, uh, is not written, you don't, you don't read it chronologically like you, you would uh, say the book of Daniel, the book of Exodus. Right? Um, probably because uh, Jeremiah's prophecies were confiscated by the king and burned, and, he had, and, and, and Baruch had to rewrite the whole thing after that. that. That's probably one of the reasons why there's not a clear organization or a clear chronology of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, also, uh, reading the book of Jeremiah requires that we sort of get some historical background. We kind of have to understand what, what, what is the political and the uh, military history back, back in those days? What's kind of the religious history, the cultural history of the time? W without really an understanding of those things, it's, it is really difficult to sort of really grasp, you know, Jeremiah. And you, you also sort of have to know kind of the timeline. Uh, where Jeremiah is situated, what's going on, you know, in the world in Jeremiah's lifetime. And so, um, you know, if, if we don't have a, a good solid understanding of that historical background, the book of Jeremiah can be hard to understand. But these things are, are certainly uh, over, you know, these are, these are obstacles that can easily be overcome uh, for the student of the book of Jeremiah. And it's certainly worth it. To, to get that background and to learn sort of the arrangement of Jeremiah as it is because the message of Jeremiah is so wonderful and so powerful. Um, you know, uh, it's interesting. Um, Jeremiah has a, a, a fascinating background. His name, Jeremiah, in Hebrew means Yahweh hurls. Right? We can almost imagine God hurling Jeremiah into the midst of a sinful people to bring a message of judgment, a message of doom, a message of warning, but also a message of hope and of encouragement and of the grace of God. His native home was in the town of Anathoth, which was in the territory of Benjamin. Jeremiah's life was marked by constant sadness. And in the first 20 years or so of his ministry, Jeremiah was a reluctant prophet. He was disillusioned by the fact that nobody believed his message. 
and he loved his people, but he was also deeply frustrated and angry with his people for rejecting his message. And also, he was very disillusioned and angry with God. And we'll see that as we walk through the text. A study of Jeremiah's life is the study of the life of a prophet who is called by God to speak a message to a recalcitrant and unrepentant people. Jeremiah has a lot of personal paradoxes in his life, too. He was, we know, because we see this in the text of the book of Jeremiah, that as a man, he was sort of a timid man. He was sort of gentle, mild-mannered. You know, he wasn't, uh, the, the, the popular image of Jeremiah is this sort of raging prophet, right? But his personality was really not like that at all. He really wanted to have warm friendships. He didn't like confrontation. He didn't like getting up into people's faces. And that wasn't his personality. And yet, he was always contending against sin in his 40-year ministry. More than anything else in the world, the one thing that he wanted was a wife. He wanted the love, the companionship of a wife. He wanted to have his own family. He asked God to give him a wife, and God said no told him he couldn't have a wife. And his, uh, his desire to have a wife, his desire to have a family, was denied him because God wanted him to enter into the experience of rejection because the people had rejected God. And so God, in calling Jeremiah to speak his word, he needed to live out the experience of being rejected. He was, by calling, a powerful prophet of the Lord. But he also, and we see this time and time again in his, in his ministry, he had a lot of struggles, personal struggles, with his calling. He had a lot of doubts about God's faithfulness. He even called God a liar more than once. And yet, by the end of his ministry, he was able to look back and see the great faithfulness of God, despite the fact that he had gone through seasons of his life in which he had doubted, in which he had been discouraged. So he was born in Anathoth. He was born in the year 646 B.C. And here is his uh, birth, birth year in the line of the history of the people of God from 722, when the northern kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians, and 586, when Jerusalem fell to Nebuchadnezzar at the end of Jeremiah's ministry and around the end of his life. He was born here in 646. He was called to be a prophet in the year 626. So he was about 20 years old at the, at the oldest. He might have been even as young as about 15. So he was a very young man, maybe a late teenager, 20 years old or so at the oldest. The Lord forbade him to marry. He had no disciples. And he had only one person that stayed with him during his ministry. And that was his faithful scribe, Baruch. Imagine that. Imagine, imagine embarking upon a, a, a ministry of four decades, a preaching ministry, a prophetic ministry of four decades and not having a single person believe your message and repent of sin. Jeremiah is not a study of failure. Jeremiah is a study of faithfulness. It's his, um, his, his life's work, his ministry, is really a testimony to the hardness of heart of the people of God more than it is a testimony of Jeremiah's failure. And that's an encouragement as well. When we witness to people, when we share Christ's gospel with people, and we don't see a lot of results, we don't see God saving people when we witness to them. I remember when I was in seminary, uh, there, there was a guy that I, that I was friends with. He, he was just an, evangelist, an evangelism machine. He, he, he witnessed to everything, you know? He witnessed to a, a stone wall, you know? He, he just would share. He actually shared Christ with a policeman that pulled him over, you know, for speeding. I mean, he shared the gospel at at truly at all times and in all places. I watched him at one point, I was, I was having a, there was a, an ice cream sort of sandwich shop right off of campus. 
and I was sitting there with my wife, and we were having a, I was having a grilled cheese sandwich, right? We were having dinner. And he walks in, and there's, you know, there's, there's a, a bunch of people in, in, this, in this little restaurant. And we said hello, we chatted for a minute. And then he started witnessing to, uh, to the manager, which was a little old lady. And she threw him out. <laughs> she, he was witnessing to her, sharing Christ with her. She didn't want to hear it. And she kicked him out of her uh, restaurant. And I watched this whole thing uh, take place. And then I felt bad that, why didn't I? You know, why didn't I witness to this lady? I should have gotten kicked out too. Right? So he was a person that witnessed and he saw a lot of people come to know Christ. And you know, I am not that way. I've, I share the gospel. And I've been sharing the gospel for all of my Christian life. As a, I've been saved for 31 years, and of course I've been sharing Christ with people all through my Christian life. But I can only say that I've only led a, a handful of people to the Lord in my, in my years, not very many. Uh, most memorably, I led my cousin to the Lord. Um, and I had a hand also, I, I think so, I think this is part of his testimony, my brother's salvation in 2005. But, but it's very rare. I, I really haven't led a lot of people to the Lord, despite mission trips and despite all kinds of things that I've done in my life. And, in, you know, Jeremiah's 40-year um, ministry, not, not leading a single person to faith in, in, in the Lord, while I regret that for the sake of, of uh, the people, I, I, I'm, I'm thankful that, you know, there are people in the Bible that I can identify with. I don't have to say, gosh, what a failure I am. Because look at Jeremiah, you know, he was faithful to the Lord's calling, he preached God's word, and nobody came to faith. But that is, that is not a judgment on Jeremiah's faithfulness. So it's a comfort to me, and I think it's a comfort for, for all of us. The years of his ministry were a time of chaos, morally, politically, socially, spiritually. Um, you know, you have the split between the northern and southern kingdoms in the reign of Rehoboam in the 10th century BC. You have the northern kingdom as taken by Assyria in the year 722 BC. You have Egypt and Assyria and Babylon, the great empires of the world, in the 600s and in the 500s BC, vying for control of the land of Israel and Palestine. And there are two great battles that, that, were, that, that these great empires fought over. In, at the end of the 7th century. In 609, the Battle of Megiddo, and in 605, the Battle of Carchemish were both fought uh, at, the, at the very end of the 600s. Also, in the year 715, Hezekiah, who was the king of Judah during the ministry of Isaiah, he came to the throne in 715, and he ruled until his death in 687. He was one of the longest reigning kings of Judah, and he was a righteous king, one of the few righteous kings in Judah's history. And he instituted reforms for the, for the soul worship of Yahweh, doing away with idol worship. But Hezekiah's good reforms were overshadowed by the dark reign of his son, Manasseh, who came to the throne in 697, and he ruled until 642. He was the longest reigning king in uh, Judah's history. For 10 years, Manasseh and Hezekiah ruled together. And then when Hezekiah died in 687, Manasseh ruled by himself until 642. And Manasseh was a godless king. Came to the throne. He, he ruled for uh, over 50 years. And during his reign, you have idol worship on a scale never seen before in Judah's history. When he died in 642, his son, Amon, ruled from 642, and he ruled for two years and died in 640. When Amon died, he was succeeded by Josiah, uh, the, the, the last of the faithful kings of Judah. Josiah was a great king, and when he was eight years old, he... Uh, he began leading a, he, well, he became king at eight years old, and, and early on in his reign, he led a, a system of reforms uh, designed to destroy idol, idolatry and reintroduce the worship of Yahweh into the life of the people of God. And these reforms were well, were well received during uh, Josiah's reign. But Josiah died in 609, 
he was actually killed in the Battle of Megiddo by the Egyptian pharaoh Necho. Now when he died, he was succeeded by an evil king named Jehoiakim in 609. And Jehoiakim gave, uh, under Jehoiakim's uh, reign, Jeremiah preached his famous temple sermon, which we see in, in chapters 7 through 10 of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, in the temple sermon, he said, Jeremiah preached, he said, only repentance and the worship of Yahweh alone would guarantee security to the nation. In the, in the uh, very uh, threatening environment that uh, Judah lived under, with Egypt, Assyria, and Nebuchadnezzar all vying for control of Palestine. Uh, in the temple sermon, this is where Jeremiah tells the people that unless you repent, Jerusalem and the temple will be destroyed. Jeremiah experienced bitter opposition uh, to that sermon and to his entire ministry, and yet he loved and he agonized over the people of God. So the Battle of Megiddo was fought in 609. Josiah was killed in that battle, and another great battle in 605 was fought, the Battle of Carchemish. This was in the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign, Jehoiakim who replaced Josiah. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, actually invaded Judah and defeated uh, Pharaoh Necho of Egypt um, and defeated the Assyrians at Carchemish. In this battle, Carchemish in 605 answered the question, what great power was going to control Palestine and the, the territory that Judah occupied? And the answer to that question would be Babylon. Babylon would dominate the entire world of the Near East from 605 well into the, uh, the, the years of the 500s, the, the 6th century BC. Uh, when Egypt was defeated at Carchemish, Jeremiah counseled that it was God's will to surrender to Babylon, to submit itself to the will of Nebuchadnezzar, that that was God's will. That was what God was calling the people to do, and not to resist Babylon because God was judging his people. In 597, just a few years after the Battle of Carchemish in 605, Jehoiakim rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar killed him. He sent uh, an army to Jerusalem, laid siege to the city in 597, and killed Jehoiakim. And Nebuchadnezzar replaced him with Jehoiachin, or his, he also goes by the name Coniah. Jehoiachin, or Coniah, only ruled for about three months. and He was replaced by Zedekiah. Zedekiah was the last of the Davidic rulers of Judah. He reigned for 11 years, from 597 until 586, when Nebuchadnezzar wiped out uh, the kingdom of Judah. Now, during the time, from 597 until 586, under Zedekiah's rule, Jeremiah preached that the people needed to submit to Babylon. Well, he was viewed as a traitor. He was viewed as unpatriotic. You know? He was viewed as sort of like, you know, you're, why, why are you telling us to turn our back on our country? Turn our back on our people. You know, submit to these pagans. And he was persecuted very severely by Zedekiah and by others in his day. But God's will was to punish Judah by bringing her under the dominance of Babylon because of Judah's stubbornness, because of Judah's idol worship. Now, under the reign of Zedekiah, who became king in 597, Zedekiah was sort of a coward. You know, Zedekiah was certainly opposed to the preaching of Jeremiah, but, but he sort of pretended to be Jeremiah's friend and ally. But he would, he had a very, uh, you know, he was, he was very strongly influenced by, you know, the aristocrats of Judah, his nobles in Judah. And he was pressured by his nobles to persecute Jeremiah, and he did. He caved to their, to cave to their desires. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar appointed a man named Gedaliah 
to be a, a governor of Judah after 586, after he laid siege to Jerusalem in 586. But Gedaliah was assassinated um, by a descendant of David's throne. The Jews who were left alive after 586, after the destruction of Jerusalem, kidnapped Jeremiah and took him uh, to Egypt with them. And in Egypt, Jeremiah continued to denounce the idolatry of the Jews, continued to preach, continued to minister, to minister, and tradition holds that Jeremiah was killed. He was martyred in Egypt. Jeremiah encountered more opposition to his ministry, to his preaching, from his own countrymen than any other prophet in the whole history of ancient Israel. Unlike Elijah, unlike Isaiah and others, Jeremiah did not call his people to fight against the enemies of the nation. Instead, he called his people to submit to the enemies. Very, very different kind of a message. And he consistently preached the message of unconditional surrender to Babylon. A shocking message and one that sets him apart from the other prophets of ancient Israel's history. Now, we're getting to the end of this, and, and as I close, I want to sort of review for you the historical events on this timeline here. So going back to 722 BC, we have the fall of the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel. And the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by Assyria, and Assyria would attempt to conquer the southern kingdom of Judah in 701 BC under the rule of Sennacherib. We read about this uh, in several places. One place we read about this is, is in Isaiah 37 through 39. Sennacherib fails to conquer Jerusalem in 701. God delivers the people of Judah from Sennacherib in 701 BC. It's a key date. It's a key date because, because people in Jeremiah's day in Judah, they remembered 701 BC. They thought that Jerusalem would never be abandoned to the enemies of God because of what God had done in 701. And my Old Testament professor in seminary used to talk about it like this. He said, people walked around with t-shirts in Jeremiah's day that said, I survived 701 BC and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. I mean, 701 BC was definitely on everyone's mind and they thought that Jerusalem was inviolable. And they were going to find out that that was not true. But nevertheless, in 701, the Assyrians fail to conquer Jerusalem. In 715, Hezekiah becomes king. He's king in 701 when Sennacherib comes. In 697, Manasseh and Hezekiah begin their joint rule. And in 687, Manasseh rules uh, by himself. And from 687 to 642, Manasseh was the sole king of Israel. He was the most wicked king, or excuse me, of Judah. He was the most wicked king in Judah's history. 646, Jeremiah was born just a few years before the death of Manasseh, the rise of Ammon, his son. Ammon comes to the throne in 642. He only rules for two years. He's also an idol-worshiping king. He dies in 640, and he is replaced by Josiah, who was only eight years old at the time of his accession to the throne. Josiah would rule from 640 until 609, when he was killed at the Battle of Megiddo. When he was killed, he was actually involved in, in, in a bit of sin. Uh, God had continually told his people not to ally themselves with their uh, neighbors. And yet, Josiah was afraid of the Babylonians, and he allied himself to Assyria. And he was killed uh, in battle by Pharaoh Necho in that battle. So he was, he was killed in the midst of acting on uh, really dis distrust of the Lord. He should have, you know, he should have put his trust in the Lord and not allied himself and not gone, on, got, gone in to fight, but he, he disobeyed. So this is a very tragic thing when he's killed it in 609. In 626, Jeremiah is called as a prophet. We read about this in Jeremiah 1, and we will look at that uh, very shortly. In 608, Jehoiakim comes to the throne Jehoiakim reigns until 597. Jehoiakim is a very wicked king, very much opposed to Jeremiah's ministry, and Jeremiah's uh, most um, severe oppressor and persecutor. In 605, you have the Battle of Carchemish. 
in which Babylon is victorious over the Egyptians and the Assyrians. And Babylon will, will be the dominant power that will um, sort of, you know, t uh, uh, he establishes um, his uh, supremacy over Judah and over Palestine as a whole. In 605, you have the first group of exiles that are taken from Judah and taken off to Babylon. And in this first group of exiles, you have people like Daniel. You have people like Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah, otherwise known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They all are taken in 605 and sent to, uh, to Babylon as exiles. And they begin there. Daniel begins his ministry then. In 597, uh, Nebuchadnezzar sends another army. He lays siege to Jerusalem. He deposes Jehoiakim. He establishes Jehoiachin and Zedekiah. And you also have a second group of exiles that are taken in 597 back to Babylon. Then in 586, 587, 586, Nebuchadnezzar invades Judah again for a third time, surrounds Jerusalem for a 15-month siege, ultimately destroys the city, destroys the old temple that Solomon had built, leaving not one stone upon another. And this takes place again, 587, 586, temple is destroyed, and the third group of exiles are taken, in the final group. This is also when, uh, when you have... Uh, the passages in Deuteronomy 27, 28 are fulfilled where God says to the people, if you are disobedient to the covenant, then ultimately what you can expect is to be conquered by a foreign nation and you will attempt to go back to Egypt. You will offer yourselves as slaves, but no one will want to buy you. Right? You have the fulfillment of that prophecy in 586 uh, B.C. One last thing I want to say about the book of Jeremiah and about the person of Jeremiah and the prophet Jeremiah. And this may be the most important thing I can say in this entire Bible study. In many ways, there are very close and very striking resemblances of Jeremiah to Jesus Christ. For one thing, Christ and Jeremiah, they have their ministries in very similar historical settings. Jerusalem would be dominated by a foreign power and was getting ready to fall. In Jeremiah's time, that foreign power would, of course, be Babylon under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. And, of course, Nebuchadnezzar would come, invade uh, Judah, seize the city of Jerusalem, and destroy it along with the temple. Jesus is, of course, ministering under the domination of the Roman Empire. The Romans had been in, in uh, Judea, since the 60s BC, they remained uh, the dominant power in Jesus' ministry in the first years of the first century AD. And just a few years after Jesus' uh, ascension into heaven, uh, the Romans came and destroyed the temple. Uh, also, something similar about their ministries in Jeremiah's ministry, which we, we're definitely going to see again and again and again in our study of the book of Jeremiah, and in Jesus' ministry, very well known to us, Religion was dead and formalized. And both Jesus and Jeremiah uh, have a message uh, of warning uh, for the people who were following that dead uh, and formalized religion and worship. Both Jesus and Jeremiah have a message not only for the people of God, not only for the Jews, but for the entire world. Both of their messages are universal messages to all of humanity. Both Jeremiah and Jesus will use nature in their teaching, in the stories that they tell, in the illustrations that they use. They'll look to the natural world. Both Jesus and Jeremiah emphasize again and again and again their call from God uh, to uh, do the work of their ministry. Both condemned the commercialization of temple worship. Both were accused of treason. Both were tried, persecuted, imprisoned. Both foretold the destruction of the temple. Both wept over the city of Jerusalem. Both condemned the priests of their day. 
Both were tender-hearted. Both loved Israel deeply. Both knew the loneliness uh, that went with being a prophet. And both enjoyed unusual intimacy with God. You know, one of the striking things, one of the most striking things I find about Jeremiah is Jeremiah ministers 40 years. He doesn't have a single convert. Not one person repents of their sin as a result of Jeremiah's preaching. For year after year after year, he's finally kidnapped by his people, taken down to Egypt, and put to death by them. And he dies in obscurity, right? He dies in apparent failure. But then 600 or so years later, Jesus sends out the disciples two by two to go out and to proclaim the kingdom of God, to proclaim the gospel to all the towns in Galilee. And in Matthew 16, we have a, a report about them gathering back together. And Jesus asked the disciples, who do the people say that I am? And Jeremiah had, had, had become... Uh, had, had become such an important prophet in Jesus' day. Uh, he, was not, he did not die in obscurity. He was remembered. He was credited with the survival of the people after Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the temple. He was seen as a faithful man of God after he died, such that the disciples said to Jesus, some people say, you're Jeremiah. It's an amazing, amazing testimony his faithfulness. So, I'm really excited about this Bible study. Thank you that you're going to be joining me in it, and I pray that this will be a blessing to all of us and to our church. Let me close in prayer. Dear God, I thank you so much for this book. Thank you so much for these verses in this book and its connections to the rest of Scripture, what you have to teach us in this book. And Lord, may we May we align our minds and our hearts to Christ. Lord, I pray that you would form us and make us into the image of Christ as we drink deeply, as we immerse ourselves in this book of this great prophet. One day, Lord, we will, we will be beholding you face to face as we stand in heaven in glory. And we will be alongside your servant, Jeremiah, when we do. I look forward to that day. Until then, Lord, bless us, speak to us, reveal yourself to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you very much.